Father Lord, we thank you. We exalt and honor you once again. We thank you for the privilege to come to your presence once again today. To exalt and to honor you in the assembly of the saints. Father Lord, today is another Sunday. We thank you for the opportunity to understand prophecy. For the opportunity to understand the things you have revealed concerning us. Lord, we commit our ways into your hands. Holy Spirit, we are going to be teaching tonight. We ask for your presence. We ask for your guidance. We ask for the counsel. We ask the Lord to guide and direct our path. We ask, O oh Lord, that your wisdom be released mightily upon the people to understand and to learn what we are about to teach. For the Lord my God, you are the only one who can truly understand and explain your word. Give us divine insight. Understanding to search and to understand your word and to be able to teach it with wisdom. And this we ask to Jesus Christ our Lord. For the Lord, we also commit all our team, all our team, all people listening around the world, coming to this open heart fellowship to learn about your second coming, to learn about the revelation and to understand. The prophecy that you have given in scripture. For the Lord, we ask for your divine grace. We ask for your divine knowledge. We ask for your divine insight into the word of God. Give us the grace to be able to explain it with wisdom. This we ask in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome once again. This evening, we are taking you back to the scripture on our topic, Understanding Prophecy. Today, we deal with the topics. The seal. The seal. What is the seal? Why does the seal become important as a topic for us to teach? The seal, as you found in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, from verse 1. Let's read Revelation 6 from verse 1. It said, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seal, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts or living creatures saying, Come and see. Come and see. Why was this seal very important? Why does the living creature feel it is an opportunity? For all the Christendom to come and experience this seal. Why was John invited to seal this seal? Why not the angels passing the information down to him on earth in the writing? Why, not, why is it necessary for the Christian to be in heaven and witness the opening of the seal? Not on earth suffering the consequences of the seal like other earth dwellers. Today we are going to open those mysteries because there are two groups of people the scriptures specify in the book of Revelation. We have the righteous saints which are in heaven observing the seal, looking down upon the earth and experiencing the opening of the scroll. Then we have another group which the Bible called the earth dwellers. These people are on earth. They are not in heaven. They did not see the angel open the seal, but rather they suffer the consequences of the seal that were opened. And these are two groups. Like week we explained to you that the reason why many of us witness the experience of the earth similar to the scriptural events and many Christians who are the post millennial or whatever claim that everything has been fulfilled but they fail to understand one specific fact that God promised the believers that we will not experience his wrath. God cannot allow his children to go through the wrath. Last two weeks we expect we explained the facts to you the reason why Believers cannot experience the wrath of God because God promised that He will not punish the righteous with the wicked. 
As long as the wrath is coming from God, the believer cannot experience it. Because that is a promise he made. He even told Lot that he cannot destroy Sodom until Lot is gone. And then that, even in the beginning, let's go back to Genesis. God did not do anything until Noah entered the ark. So the same thing, God cannot do anything in this end of the world. He does not break his covenant. Because the Bible says his covenant will be no break. Neither will he utter the word that proceed from his mouth. He has said to Abraham that God forbid that the Lord should punish the wicked and the righteous. He does not do it. He would never put it that God should pronounce the wicked guilty as much as the righteous. So the two of them are not the same. And that is the reason why before any judgment can take place on the earth, the righteous must be separated. Even Jesus gave us a parable in New Testament. He said, when the Lord of the house woke up and he discovered there were ties in the field, though he plant good corn in the field, and the servant said to him, Lord, let us go and wheat up the tithes. Clear it away and burn it. And the Lord said, No. While you are wheating up the tithes, you will also wheat away some clear wheat. Since they look alike, wait till harvest. In the harvest, you go first, gather the wheat into the gallery of the Lord. And burn the ties with unquenchable fire. And remember, God always separates the wheat from the tie before the judgment will be passed. Because the judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah were not indiscriminate. God allowed the righteous to be separated before the judgment fell. The judgment upon the world in Genesis. When he covered, conquered the world with flood, God separated the righteous away from the wicked by allowing Noah and his family enter the ark before the judgment fell. And even Enoch was taken away from the earth before the judgment of the Lord fell. One and two Salah died before the flood. Learn it. God has never punished the righteous and the wicked at the same time. So the same mothers, that's why we understand that the Holy Spirit tends to use in your consistently throughout the entire scriptures. God will never punish the righteous and the wicked. Tonight, we are also looking into another event in the scriptures that separates the righteous from the wicked. Today, my name is Missionary Collins. I will be your host for this evening. So this is our Open House Fellowship. Open House Fellowship is a presentation of CGF Mission which is Christian Global Foundation, is a non-denominational missionary training fellowship, which we hold every Sunday by 5 p.m. and on Tuesday by 7 p.m. This Open House Fellowship is a teaching where we use the opportunity to expand on the Word of God and to explain what the Bible is actually talking about. So today we are on the topic the opening of the seventh seal in the book of Revelation. The seventh seal of God from the Bible. What are the seventh seal? The seventh seal is a scroll that laid down the mark of history and judgment. They are not symbolic. They are book of written judgment which God has preserved to be explained to mankind at the end. And this written judgment was sealed with seven seal. And we understand from our last week's study that they searched the heaven looking for who was worthy to open the seal and to break the, each of the seal thereof. And this scroll was, in, was, was rolled up in front of a pathless. And the way it is sealed is that whenever you break one seal, a part of the document will be available to you. And when you break the second part of the seal, another part of the scroll will be available to you. 
But when you break the whole seven seal, the whole document of God's judgment will be visible. So that was how, why they search the heaven, the earth, and the sea, looking for who was worthy to look into God's judgment, who was worthy to be able to see it, that was free from sin, whose hand was not stained with iniquity, and who was worthy of God's love and mercy, that he was slain and has redeemed us from our God. And when they searched the heaven, they searched the earth, they searched the sea, and they searched under the earth, no one was worthy. Nobody was formed. But at last, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the conquering roots of David, the lamb itself, rose from the midst of the throne. And that was clearly Jesus Christ. Because the son of the redeemed told us, he was slain to redeem us to God and has made us king and priests unto God and we will reign with him on earth. So let's dive in. The seventh seal of God from the Bible, from the book, Bible book of Revelation are the seven seal. They are symbolic in Greek is Spagida that secured the book or scroll that John of Patmos saw in an apocalyptic vision. This opening of the seals of the document occurred in Revelation chapter 5 to 8. The event leading up to the seal happened in Revelation chapter 5, while the seal proper is in Revelation chapter 6 to 8 to 7. And they mark the second coming of Christ and the beginning of the Apocalypse of Revelation. Remember, in the book of Daniel, we dealt with the 69 weeks. This event of the seal is what takes place in the 70th week of Daniel chapter 20. Daniel chapter 26. This is the 70th week. And this event, Daniel chapter 21 verse 26, sorry. This is the event of the 70th week. And this event that takes place in the 70th week explains to us the vision of the Lord and his plan for the whole universe. And that 70th week is the most documented time in the entire Bible history. Why? The Holy Spirit explained it to us in various places of the Bible. He explained it in terms of yes, he explained it in terms of days. He explained it even in terms of hours. If you want it in microseconds, he will give it to you. Because he wanted men to be aware of this whole 70th week. But this 70th week, remember, it was divided into two. And this scroll also explained the reason why it was divided into two. We have the first three and a half weeks, which the Bible calls three and a half years. And the second three and a half years, which is half of the week, half of the week. The first three and a half years was the Antichrist rising in dominions to power. And that's what happened in the three and a half years. It was not a time of great tribulation, but the Antichrist was rising to power. Then when the Lamb, upon the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, opening the seal on the cover of the book scroll, a judgment is released, an apocalyptic event occurs. The opening of the first four seals released the four horsemen, which have become a popular song for people. They call it the first horsemen and the apocalypse, each with his own specific vision. The opening of the fifth seal symbolizes the Christ of the martyrs, the word of wrath of God. And the sea seals prunt in the prayer, storms, and catamic events. Then the seventh seal clues seven angelic trumpets. Who in turn blew the seven bowls? 
slew the seven bulls' judgments among the catamic events. Certainly, the word or the phrases used in Revelation has had a clearer meaning in the ancient reader familiar with the object of this time. For example, it is important document we have written in purpose, true still, with seven wax seal. And these wax seals were typically placed across the opening of a scroll, so that only the proper person in the presence of witness could open the document. Is known as a tattoo deed. This type of seal is frequently used in a figurative sense in the book of Revelation. Only the lamb is worthy to break off this seal. Revelation 6, verse 3 to 4. And when he had opened the first seal, let's read what happened at the event when the lamb opened the first seal. And I saw Revelation 6 from verse 1. It said, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard it were the noise of thunder. One of the living creatures, four living creatures, which are the Spirit of God, call and see, saying, Come and see. And in verse 2, it said, And I saw, beheld, a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. Remember what happened here. Take a clear dimension look at the event that happened. When he opened the first seal, what happened? A white horse appeared. Many Christians have mistaken this white horse. For Christ, no, it's first Christ. It's the big, big guy. Christ is not riding the horse. He is opening the seal. The man who rode the horse is clearly the Antichrist. And he was riding a white horse, symbolizing false righteousness. False righteousness. That is the symbol. And he was conquering through false righteousness. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, by peace, he will deceive what? Many. So he is rising to power, not in war, not in battle, but making peace. And this signing of this covenant kick in the seven years of peace. It is this covenant that noted the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist. The covenant of peace. And that is what you saw in the White House. He went on conquering the world, bringing them together for a conference to sign a contract of seven years of peaceful covenant between Israel and the Palestine over the wall of Jerusalem, over the island of Jerusalem, which is the most disputed land in history. And not only that, and peace of many things with the world, bring an end to war, restore peace to nations. And he will be judged as a righteous Christ. Israel who came to at a point to believe he was the Christ. Because he brought them peace. Because tomorrow if you ask the people of Israel, what, why are you still expecting the Messiah? They will tell you when the Messiah comes, he will bring us peace. And this man will bring false peace to them. And that's why he was a righteous. He does not strive. If he strive in violence, Israel would not have believed in him. Nobody in the world would have. But he came through peace. The Bible says by peace he misled many. He is not called Antichrist because he's against Christ. He is called Antichrist because he put himself in place of Christ. He is the expectant Messiah of the Jewish people. And this Antichrist is rising to power. He's conquering the world. The Bible says he will take over ten kingdoms, will in turn take over the entire world. And that is how he will strive. He is not going to come to make war. That is not his first stripes. And that's why he went for conquering, to conquer. And a crown was given to him. It's not a victor crown. It's not a victor crown. A crown was handed to him. It's not a royal dad. That means 
as he conquered, he became king as a result of his work. As a result of the conquering on the earth, he became king. He was not a king when he came out. He was not going to come out and present himself as a ruler at once. It's as a result of the deal he makes, bringing peace to the earth, that made people cry him as king. He was promoted because of the peace negotiation which he did. So he did not grow, came as a king, but he came in humility. So he came as a righteous Christ to the people, and people tend to believe in him because he did not come with violence. He came with peace. And this peace, this first peace that promised world unity was what made the earth run after the beast. That's why the Bible makes it clear to us that all the world worship the beast. All the world. Why would all the world worship a man that came in violence? No, they worship him because he came in unity and peace. Promoting world peace. That was his system. And when he came, they believed in him because of his unity. The Bible says this period of peace he practiced was a period for a period of three and a half years. The covenant of peace he made with the rest of the world was for seven years that there will be constant peace, and which is the last seven years in the history of mankind. But this time the saints are gone, the earth is destabilized, the Christians are no more, the church and visions have come to an end. This is the time this peace agreement was signed. The peace agreement does not exist today, contrary to what people tell you. This is because vision and prophecy has not come to an end. This means everlasting righteousness is not even close. But this time we are talking about visions and believers and the church age has come to a close. Today we still have the church age. The time of the Gentile exists from Nebuchadnezzar to the day of the duration of the Antichrist. It has a beginning and it also has an end. And this seven years catastrophic period was recorded in the scripture. For the first three and a half years, this man is rising. He went conquering to conquer. He's rising to power. So it is not the Antichrist who is behind the events that took place at the Great Tribulation, as many Christians suppose. God is the one who directed the wrath upon the unjust nation. It is not the Antichrist's wrath, because today the Antichrist is the most fearful man in the entire universe. He is not the one you should fear. Fear God. Because God is the one who directs the wrath. The Antichrist is one of the wrath. He is not the only wrath at the end of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation was not just called Great. It's not just tribulation. Some people will say, yeah, we have famine today. We have war. We have this. Yes, these things exist today. They have existed before we were born. They existed from the beginning of the world. The Lord make it clear to you, it is going to get bigger and more worse till the end. That is the event. But the ultimate calamity of all punishment is the great tribulation. And this is the time it's going to... The situation is not going to be different from what you experienced, but it's going to get worse than what you have ever experienced since the earth ever existed. And the Bible makes it clearer to us that as he opened this first seal, this Antichrist went from conquering nations to conquer. He was conquering them not through battle, but through peace. That was how he went. That was how he got the whole world under his domain. For the period, the Bible does not specify the time and the period at which this took place. But we knew he went up conquering to conquer. That was when he opened the first seal. But before any of the judgment we had ever passed down, we knew that the saints are no more in the earth. The saints were taken out of the earth. That means it took place between the first three and a half years of peace. So, what is the event leading to the second seal being opened? The Lord opened the second seal. What happened? When he had opened the second seal, I heard 
the second living creature say, Come and see. There went out another horse. This time it was red. Red. What does red symbolize? Violence. The power was given him that sat on him to take peace from the earth. This time the three and a half years of peace has expired. So, the Antichrist has gained dom dominance over the world already. He is no longer looking for authority. Just as we read in the ancient history, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the Antichrist has gotten all the power and dominion through unity and peace. And first peace that promised world unity. And that was made as a covenant to many for a period of seven years. Now, half of the week he has gotten everything he wanted. And opportunity to unleash his wrath upon mankind. He is going to promise false unity and power and grace and unity, democracy, and that is how he rises for power. And now he has risen. The whole world has given him his mandate, made one world president. He has all the power he needs. Even Israel and the Palestine and the rest of the world came to believe in him. Even the Muslim logically come under him, the Chinese and all the human race came and bowed to him because of the power of peace he preached. And he was able to persuade, he was a charismatic leader. The world through peace came to him. But now, in this three and a half years, has elapsed. That means from the duration of the first seal and the second seal took place between a period which we call three and a half years or half of the week. That was the time he rose to power. The Antichrist did not rise to power instantly. No, he rose to power within a period of three and a half years. And that three and a half years, he met his leadership around the entire universe. Then after that, he unleashed disaster for half of the week. That means half of the week, he break the covenant he made with mankind. And that covenant, what was it? The covenant to maintain peace for seven years, promising the unity. That covenant was broken by half of the week. Three and a half years. For three and a half years, the covenant he made was broken. And when he broke this covenant, he ushered in the great tribulation. And that's why the Bible says, when he opened the second seal, he had the beast saying, come and see. And went forth another horse that was right. And the power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth. Now we have, let's sit down and think back a little. Now we still have peace in the world. We still have people that want to kill one another. We have people manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. Think about a time when peace is taken from the earth. What will people do to themselves? And the man that was sat on this horse was given authority to take peace away from the earth. God gave him the authority. The Antichrist is not the ultimate force at the Great Tribulation. God, the devil, has a purpose. That's why, as a Christian, you must understand the reign of dominions and powers. Everything in the universe carries out God's will, including Lucifer. They were created for his glory and for his purpose. That's why the Song of the Redeemed says, for all things we are created for that pleasure. They are and we are created. Everything in the universe were created for the pleasure of the Lord, including Lucifer and his agents. The purpose of the Antichrist was to show what God wrought. He was an agent of wrath unto the Lord. And that's why the Bible says he went forth conquering to conquer. In the first set, but the second scroll, once it's open, peace was taken from the earth. The Antichrist removed peace from the surface of the earth. Men begin to keep each other. So these statements are clearly understood that this great tribulation, these three and a half years, expand to cover the whole 
from the beginning of the rod to the end of the entire rod in the book of Revelation, from the seal to the scroll and even the bow. They all took place within the remaining three and a half years, starting from when power was taken from the earth, when the men were given the right to kill one another. And there was given unto him that sat on it a great sword. And this sword was not the word of God. This sword was the sword of war, battles, to dismantle and to kill one another. And remember, we will understand it clearly when we get to the fifth seal. The matters head were off in the fifth seal as a result of this sword, which was given to this man. He removed all the head of the believers who rejected the mark of the beast and they were beheaded for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, which they had. So that is the purpose. So this verse 2 set up the events of the catastrophic disaster of the Antichrist. When he began to punish them that refused to accept his side, and when Israel also refused to bow to him because they discovered he has broken his covenant, and as a result, battle kicks in. So that was what leads, and even the Christians, because Israel were divinely protected in the tribulation, he decided to make war with the rest of the seed of Jesus Christ, which bear the mark of God. And the woman in chapter 13 in the book of Revelation explained that. He made war with the rest of the seed. And when he made war with the rest of the seed, who bear the testimony of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the Lord. So these are Christians who remain in the tribulation We face untold hardship because the Antichrist will not want to divide he will not want a divided worship he wants the whole world to worship him absolutely but as long as you worship him you don't have problem but if you refuse or you don't take his seal you wait for the death and that is the only solution nobody is protected that remain on earth in the tribulation so stop listening to some people who read that believers believers are not protected in the tribulation it is only the Jewish that was protected in the tribulation. And God did it for a reason. The 144,000 are the Jewish evangelists supernaturally endowed with the power of angels to preach to the whole world through the end of the tribulation. And the two witness prophecies were the product. They are not in existence today because they have not been saved. These two we did were the product of the two witness prophecies. We prophesied in Israel and get the harlot Rahab saved. It's just exactly catastrophic event that took place in the book of Joshua. When Joshua sent out the two spies to visit the land of Canaan, when they were being pursued, they ran to the plain of Jericho and the gate was shut. And the heart of Rahab saved the spies and they were locked up in his house. And this he led them down through the window, but before he led them down, he made them promise that if when God destroyed Jericho, he would not touch him and his household. So when the children of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, the wall of Jericho fell down. But the house at the wall of Rehab, God did not touch it. That was the promise. And the joy was that Israel got the Rehab saints, who was the grandmother of wars, and who finally gave birth to them. Which room Christ came from. And now this same dimension is that the purpose of these two weakness prophecies is to get the heart of Israel saved. And that's what we're going to explain in Revelation chapter 13. I believe this set a preamble of what we are going to be seeing throughout the study of the book of Revelation. These two weakness prophecies, their job was to get Israel saved. And when Israel gets saved, what happened? There were 144 evangelists armed with the word of God to bring the gospel of the kingdom to all nations of the earth. And that was why Christ said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations as a testimony against them before the end can come. So that is the job. So the, end, the world tribulation will not be concluded until Jewish evangelists completed their mission of evangelizing the entire world. And that was when the end. This preaching will be preached in the great tribulation. And the Bible say, after this, I beheld a number which no man can number, came from under the throne. This were a product of these evangelists 
vision. They were a product of their work on earth. They were the crowd which no man can know about. They were not part of the righteous saints. Remember the saints were given a crown and a dad in heaven. But what happened to these people? They cried with a loud voice and they have palm leaf in their hands. And this symbolizes the mass that followed Jesus on the triumphant entry into Jerusalem when they have palm on their hand. And they have palm. No crown was given to them because they were people saved from the great tribulation. Because the Bible said, blessed are those who took part in the first resurrection for these are the true saints of God. But these people, they came from the tribulation. They were counted with the nation of Israel. So they did not have the victor crown that we the saints will say. So this is exactly the preamble of what took place from this rot. So this seal, conquering to conquer, set up a seal for the Antichrist rising to power in the first seal. Why the second seal open up a vision for us which teaches us that the Antichrist second three and a half years was in violence. The sword was given to him to remove peace of, from the earth. Then, what happened when he opened the third seal? When he opened the third seal, something happened. I will read from Revelation 6, verse 5. Revelation 6, verse 5. What happened when he opened the third seal? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creatures, they come and see. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balance in his hand. A pair of balance in his hand. What was he doing with a pair of balance? <laughs> and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a penny. A measure of wheat for a penny. Three measure of barley for a penny. And see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. What does this symbolize? Famine. Famine. Somebody will say, but we are already in famine now. There's no. You are in famine, but not compared to what the Bible speaks about here. We are talking of the kind of famine that... Your entire day work will be only be available for one rational food for one man for a day. And your full day's work, if you want to go for something less nutritious, it will be enough to feed one man three times a day. That is a horse food. So this is exactly what it's telling you. That all your entire labor in life for one day can only feed you with one square meal per day. But what happened here? Look at what the Bible says here. It says, see that thou art not the oil and the wine. That means the food we are available. But somebody kept it. We don't know what happened. I don't want to suggest anything. But we knew that at that point in time, food were available, but it was not distributed. Family exists. It's a man-made family that will exist under the reign of the Antichrist. Remember what the Bible says, that no man can buy or sell except he has the mark of the beast and the number of what? His name. So it was artificial family that was created by man, not real family. So, let's go further. When he opened his seal, we discover that God said, Hot not the oil and the wine. So this wine and oil was available in abundance. God did not hurt the feet on the ground, but there was famine. Man created it. Maybe as a result of those poor, the farmer could not go to farm. And as a result, hunger issued in him. Food were not produced. So not because the food were not, the ground was not fruitful, but because food were not produced during this year of great tribulation. So as a result, hunger set in. And the people were beginning to eat themselves, as it was in the days of King. 
Now that we understand the second seal, the third seal, let's go to the event that took place when the Lamb opened the feet, the fourth seal. <laughs> when he saw, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. <clears throat> and I look and I beheld a pale horse. A pale horse. What is pale? Pale symbolizes the word in Greek, chrono, which is green. And green horse. And what happened to this green horse? And I look. Behold, a green horse. And he and his name that sat on this horse was death, and hell followed with him. Death and hell. Death of the body, death of the spirit. That was the horse. Death all round. And the power was given over him that sat on it, over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. So let's try to decode what these four stand for. Fourth part of the earth first. What is the fourth part of the earth? One fourth of the whole world. It's the last part of the earth. This is not happening to the whole world. One fourth of human race to be exterminated. And this extermination was not done with sword. He was given power to kill with war. The third world war you have it. The war you are looking for. You have it over one fourth of the earth to kill with what death with sword, which is war, which is the language the Antichrist understands most war after the three and a half years. And this war became so violent, and the second one was to kill them with hunger. Remember the famine inherited from part one and the war that started when men were given authority peace was taken from the earth they were allowed to kill one another remember none of these things stopped after the sin was closed and another seal is open they continue war continue the family continue so the war that started when peace was taken from the earth, they were allowed to kill one another, continuing to this time. And the famine that started from two, the second stroke, when a bag of wheat, when your daily bread was enough to pay, your entire weight for a day was just enough to pay for your food for one day. But if you go for something less nutrition, you might have to be square meat a day. Now, Still continue, and now the final part was to kill them with death itself, physical death, and with the beast of the earth. Mm, that's disease. It can be beast can symbolize these two things. We have the physical beast becoming more aggressive. Two, we also have the microscopic beasts, they are not dangerous, like virus. To kill with virus, to kill with animals in the forest, to kill with whatever beast they can lay their hand on. That's continuing in these beasts. This is a great tribulation. But it is unfathomable for any Christian to think that the church will be on earth during this time. Because anybody that says that does not understand the manner of tribulation that we are talking about here. Because this is not anything you can act in a horror movie. It's twice worse. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under this altar the soul of the mantles. When he has opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the soul of them that were slain as a result of this killing, as a result of this trial, this conclusion of the catastrophic events. They cried out with what? A loud voice. They are not singing like the saints in chapter 4. Say thou art worthy. But this time they cry out with a loud voice in pains. They cry out with a loud voice. Hmm. I saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they heard. They hold on to their faith and they die because of it. They hold on to their faith because to hold on to your faith during this time of the great tribulation means death. And they die because they held on to their faith. And they, their voice cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, of, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood? They were cry their souls were crying for vengeance upon the, dwell the earth dwellers. Remember, during this end time, it's not only the Antichrist that was just responsible for the killing. The pe remember, peace we are taking from the earth. Men were allowed to kill one and others. So the killing was done by anybody that does it. That's why Jesus said to you by himself that children will cause their parents to be executed. And Children will call, even parents will cause their own children to be executed because peace does not exist. This is an event Christ Himself denotes in Matthew chapter 24 that you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That anybody that kills you will think he's doing God's service. And who is their God? The Antichrist. They will be doing him service by killing Christians who refuse to believe in this Antichrist. And that is exactly the event we're talking about here. And these are product of the work of the first seal to the fourth seal. That is the product you have in verse 5. Slaughter nations, one fourth of the earth killed, and their blood cry out for vengeance, saying, O oh Lord, avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth. And the white robe was given to every one of them because the tribulation is not over. God cannot bring the earth judgment to a conclusion yet. And the Bible says the white robe were given to them. And the white robe was given to every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants and their beckon that should be killed as they were should be completed. Because God is not going to execute half big judgment. He's going to wait for a holistic judgment. The judgment is going to come, but first, wait. Rest a little while. I give you the robe of righteousness. Remember, they were not holy when they died. Because if they were holy, they would have taken part in the rapture of the saints. But, but because they held on with faith to the testimony, as a result of their belief and their testimony, ready to die instead of going with the Antichrist. God acknowledged their faith and was counted unto them for righteousness. And that was how Abraham also was saved. The Bible says Abraham believes in God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So these ones, they believe in God. They refuse to bow to the doctrine of the Antichrist and God accomplished it by giving them a white remnant of righteousness. By their faith, they were saved. Holding on in the midst of death, not bowing to the world, save their soul, ready to take for them to die rather than to deny the Lord, gave them life. So that was the reason why a robe of righteousness was given to every one of them. Their righteousness was not as a result of their work, it's as a result of the grace and mercy of God. God gave it to them because of their faith, they earn it by their death. And so, 
a garment of righteousness was given to them. And that event concludes the fifth seal. The martyrs, they were slaughtered for the word of God. And because they heard the testimony of Jesus Christ, that was why they were slaughtered. They were not slaughtered because they live in the earth or because of war. They were killed because of the testimony. So don't mistake this for those that die in battle or those that die fighting for the Antichrist. This matter died because they held on to the testimony of God. They were killed as innocent Christians and they refused to fight back. They hold on to the principle of Christ to the end and as a result, they saved their life. So they were saved, obviously, in the tribulation. So people will be saved in the tribulation. But for you to be saved, you have to pay for your salvation with your own blood because the time of grace is over and it's expired. And when now is the appointed time, let's go back to our Christian faith. Today is the day of salvation because tomorrow might be too late. Now is the right time to be saved. Not when you have to pay for your own salvation with your own blood. Now that Christ still lives, is opportunity for you to save your life. And to buy your salvation with the blood of Christ. Where you don't have to pay with your life. Or your head being taken off. Remember these people were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And for the word of God which they had. Are you ready? The Bible says any man that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Arm yourself with the same mind to suffer in the flesh. Because if you suffer in the flesh, you have ceased from sin. So, today, a lot of Christians are giving up God for money. Giving up God for their dead cousin or dead relative. Oh, God did not bring my cousin back to life. As a result, I will not know why I worship him. I don't even believe in him. If he was God, why would he allow a child to die? My dear, you don't understand. The righteous is taken away so that the wicked might come. The Lord allowed some certain things to happen. So that his name can be glorified. Do you know the life that that child that you are crying over his death should have lived if God have not saved him at that tender age? Death is only a transformation right for the believers. It's some believer that dies, Christians do not die. We believe that death is only a transformation right for the believers. Because the death in Christ will rise first. But we who are alive shall be caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up. Remember those words. And it is going to matter in the remaining days of the earth. Now that we have understood the fifth seal, what happened when the sixth seal was opened? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the testimony of the word of God, of those that were slain for the word of God. Now we understand the event of this fifth seal. Now we understand that the event of the sixth seal will come very shortly. The event of the sixth seal takes place in a way that many Christians never expected. Remember, for we to understand better this seal seal, remember what I told you about pattern in prophecy. Last week we talked more about God's method of pattern, God's consistency in creation. When he got to the sixth day of creation, he decided, let's sit down, let's discuss the creation of man before we make it. Remember when he was creating the water, the sea, the land, uh, the birds, the trees? He never discussed any of these things. But when he comes to the sixth day creation, he says, let's see that for coffee break. Let's discuss the making of man. Let's discuss our plan and our architects. Let's observe the creation of man. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let's give him dominion over all our creation. So this is structure applies to this revelation. When it gets to the sixth seal, something strange is about to happen. God did not just go from the sixth seal straight to the seventh seal. 
he paused in the sea sail. Then, for some coffee break, before he moved to the seventh sail. So, the same thing is going to happen consistently throughout the whole book of Revelation. What happened in the sea sail? When he opened the sea sail, lo, there was a giant, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hell, and the moon became as blood. Catastrophic events. That is the sea sail. When the sea was open, hmm, the wrath of God is almost complete. The sack, the sun became dark. And you will understand that this sixth seal, <laughs> explanation of the rest of the book of Revelation also exists in this sixth seal. Always remember that what happened when the sun was dark as dark clouds in Revelation. Locusts came out of those darkness. The demon army. You're going to go, as you go through the book of Revelation, you discover that this is a heptagonal shape. That this seal is a preamble of God's judgment that opened the remaining judgment of the bow, the trumpet, and the rod. So each of these six seals is embedded in them, the rest judgment. That's why you're going to see that the rest judgment are similar, but different. So when he opened this seal, what happened? There was an earthquake, a great earthquake of the sun turning black. And the moon refused. We are black like a sackcloth of hair. That means there was no light even from the moon because the moon became like blood. And what happened after that? The star fell from heaven. The stars fell from heaven. Sometimes this is quite significant because. Here, when I read this place, I don't think literally he's talking about a star. Our star is equivalent to the sun and 20 times bigger than our planet. They are falling down. But I actually feel it was angels. They were also called the stars, the stars throughout the scriptures. These are falling angels. So, the star fell from heaven as a thick tree cast into a timely fig when it was being shaken by a mighty winds. So, we are actually talking about the falling of stars, which may perhaps literally means the fall of planets. Or, other hands, it can also mean the falling of the falling angels in a catastrophic event being cast on the earth and you know what that spell for man can do because if one devil can hold the world to ransom think about 20 million devils what they will do and the heaven depart as a scroll when it was scrolled together that means it is actually planets that fell and the mountains and the island will move out of their places Simple, symbolic, with exactly the same interpretation Jesus gave to the disciple in Matthew chapter 24 and in Mark. And the same he gave in the book of Luke. So this testimony was consistent. The Matthew departed and the hymns were placed form for them no more. And what happened next after this event? The great harlot came in remembrance before God. So we're going to go through it. We're going to discover that this seal actually sets a preamble of God's judgment upon the earth. So these are preamble. They are not concluding the judgment. This is just a view of what judgment will take place. And the mountains fall. And the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, the chiefs, the captain, the mighty men, and the bond men, and every free man, he themselves in dens of rock. They run on that rock cover. 
Why are they hiding under the rock? And they are saying to the mountain and the rock, Come out, follow us, and hide us from the face of him that sat on the throne and from the rock of the Lamb. They were hiding themselves in the caves. Remember when there is serious bomb facts in the earth, men ran under bomb shelters. This is exactly what they were doing, running under caves and rocks, hoping that it will shield them from the catastrophic events that is taking place in the sky. Because it's like the whole sky is falling. And these men are crying, hide us from the land. Why would they know that it was God judging? Because they discovered that this is not science fiction. They knew that God was executing judgment. That the day of his wrath has come. Nobody on earth is able to stand. Not the scientists, not some, not some efforts or warriors who stand when the judgment of God comes. And they cry to the mountain and the rock, say, cover us. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great days of the wrath of God has come. Who shall be able to stand? The great day of the wrath. When God wrath come actually, who can stand? Remember, this man with the same man that says, in the Psalm 2, let us take away God's rule from our head. Let's take the earth to our own territory. Let's drive God away so that we can feast the earth for ourselves. But how come they are hiding themselves when his wrath came? Why did they not face him in battle? Because the day of his wrath has come, no one is able to stand. Because at the end, there is no denying of the truth. When the truth stares at you and fix, you will not be able to lie or logically claim it's not true. You can't believe what you like right now because you are still under the duration of grace. But a time will come when those graces are taken away, you will be faced with the reality of the truth. So now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation because tomorrow might be too late. If you must save your life, you must do it now. Because if you don't save your life now, Tomorrow you may not have the chance of this salvation, nor an opportunity to save your life. And now, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four wings of the earth, the four wings of the earth, north, south, west, east. They were holding it. And why did they hold it? Mm -hmm. Holding the four wings of the earth. Remember, this event of holding the four wings of the earth is not the seventh seal. It takes place before the seventh seal. It's like a coffee break. Why they are holding, holding on in heaven for some coffee break before the seventh day or the seventh event take place? This angel were busy holding the four wings of the earth so that the wind would not so that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And if wind does not blow, that means there is no air. Everything will start still. What happened to men therefore? If there is no wind on the earth, man cannot survive with that breath. So if the wind refused to blow on the earth, the sea, on any tree, what will happen? That means total death. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God on his, having the seal of the living God, and his cry with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. They were given power to hurt the earth and the sea. And he said, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servant of our God on their forehead. Remember, while this red sea was being opened, the servant of God has not been sealed. So he is telling the angel to hold on. Don't hurt the earth yet. 
Because there's going to be a lot of hurting coming to the earth. Don't hurt the sea, don't hurt the land or the trees until we seal the servant of God. Hold on, don't destroy them yet. Let us seal the servant of God first on their forehead. <laughs> before you can hurt the tree, before you can hurt the hills, and before you can hurt the winds and the earth, and they will see. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. Sealed. Why would God seal men? And there will be a seal, a hundred and forty-four thousand of the tribe of the children of Israel. This is strange because Enoch told us in Genesis that the Lord commented with 4,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon the unrighteous sinner, upon all that the unrighteous sinner has ungodly committed. That is it. This 144,000, they were sealed. And what was their job? To preach the message of Christ in the end of time. That was their, that was their job. And who are these 144,000? <laughs> Jehovah's Witness will tell you that these are the only people that will go to heaven. <laughs> but not, but not know what the Bible tells us here. They were sealed from the tribes of the children of Israel. These are not Christians. Don't make mistake. The church does not have tribe. The church are adopted children of Abraham through Christ. They are not tribe of Israel. But this we are clearly sealed from the twelve tribe of Israel. And of the tribe of Judah, we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Reuben, we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Gad, we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Esau was sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Natali we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Manasseh we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Simeon we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Levi we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Issachar we are sealed twelve thousand. And of the twelve tribe of Issachar was sealed twelve thousand. And of the tribe of Zebulun were still 12,000, and the tribe of Joseph was still 12,000. Get understanding here. Joseph is here, and Manasseh is here. Remember, Manasseh and Ephraim are the two children of Joseph. How come Manasseh is here, and Joseph is also here? Because one person is missing, Ephraim. Why would God Delete Ephraim. He may not be here, but he's here in code. From his tribe, 12,000 will escape. So somebody will not say, well, What about the 12 lost tribe? No tribe of Israel was ever lost in the first place. Because this was sealed from the tribe of Israel. Ephraim was here under his father's name. Because Ephraim cannot be here for one reason. Because the Lord says, Idolatry will have their name brought it out. Remember when Rehoboam put the golden calf? He put one in Dan, in, in Dan, and he put one in Ephraim. These two golden calves brought the border the northern kingdom of Israel. And that's why the Bible, why was this judgment meted out on Ephraim, on, Man, on Ephraim and Dan? Because the Bible says, if there be any man or tribe, or people or nation in Israel that sold themselves to do wickedly and they said to themselves the Lord will not hear but I the Lord shall surely visit him and I shall brought out his name from under the earth and from the tribe of Israel and that was why the two names were not Dan was taken out because Dan has an idol and if we want to the idol was placed there. So the judgment of the Lord will not seal people who were guaranteed or covered by the two blankets of the idol's kingdom. 
So that's why these two tribes were not present. And so, instead of Ephraim being present, they were present under their dad name, Joseph. So Manasseh is there as a tribe. Joseph is there representing Ephraim. Remember, we always talk about the 12 tribe of Israel. But if you actually count the numbers of the children of Jacob, which both the two he adopted from Joseph, they are 14 tribe of Israel. And that's why whenever the 12 are counted in the Bible, they are always counted as 12. If you want to count them as 12, you remove Ephraim and Manasseh and join them together and call it the tribe of Joseph. But <laughs> when one or two of the tribe is missing, you will still have 12 because you cannot separate Ephraim, uh, Joseph, divide it into two and make it Ephraim and Manasseh. Then you count Joseph as well. You have 14 tribes. You have the 12 tribes also. So whenever the tribes are mentioned in Israel, whether Joseph is present or Ephraim and Manasseh are present, Joseph is still present. So because the tribe of Joseph is the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh joined together. We have half of the tribe of Manasseh or the full tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. So that is still the tribe of Joseph. So now we understand it. And when these tribes join together, we have those tribes that were sealed. Manasseh was sealed. Joseph was sealed. From the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. And Levi was sealed 12,000. Issachar was sealed 12,000. Joseph was sealed 12,000. And Zebulon was sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. And after this sealing, what happened? The product of their work were, I beheld a much, I beheld no, a great multitude. Multitude that were saved because of their work. Because somebody wondered, the two evangelists at the end time, how are they going to save the entire human race? Two evangelists. Preach around the world for three and a half years? No. They were 144,000. And that 144,000 evangelists were supernaturally protected by angels. Power was given them to be protected by angels and to rot the great tribulation throughout the tribulation that no harm can befall them until they finish their testimony. And uh, this great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, tribes, and kingdom of people, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with robe and having palm in their lips. These are the martyrs. These are the products of the salvation of the 144,000. The martyrs. These are the people that were redeemed from the earth, from the great tribulation. Remember, they have palm leaves in their hands. These acts distinct from the raptured saints. They were part of the first resurrection, but they are not among the saints that were taken before the great tribulation. These were people that were killed in the tribulation. And because they were killed in the tribulation, God has mercy on them. And they were killed because of the testimony of Jesus Christ and because of the testimony they had. So because they were killed because of the word of their testimony, the Lord saved them. And that is the reason why this multitude of people were called up to heaven. They were killed in the tribulation. So who killed them? The ex-dwellers. They killed them because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation unto our God, who sit upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, and, and all the angels stood around about the throne, having the elders and the four living creatures fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might. That is why we call it morphology. Though this morphology is now five. So seven is the complete morphology. And he said, Be unto God forever and ever. Amen. And unto the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these? Remember, John did not know who these are. 
Because John were not, they were not made known to John because they are not part of the church. So John did not know who these people are. The elder said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robe? Hence come they. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are of, these are they which came from the great tribulation, and have washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So they came out from the great tribulation. These were not righteous sects. They came from the great tribulation. So Christian who are telling you believers will go through the tribulation, they want to be part of this group, whose head will be beheaded. So these are not the righteous sect. These are people that came from the great tribulation. And therefore they have become, therefore they are before the throne of God, and they shall serve him day and night in his temple. They will not be given kingdom. They will serve God day and night in his temple. And he that sit on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither taste any more. Neither shall the sun light upon them, nor any heat. For the Lord, for the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them to the living fountain of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That is what happened. So, in conclusion, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. Remember the event we talked about before? They were all parts. They were not part of the CC, neither were they part of the event of the seventh seal, but an explanation, like a coffee break. Those were those events. God take a break to explain to you what happened on earth. That is what happened before he goes to the seventh seal. But remember, he did not do that when he come to the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth seal. But between six and seven, there is always an interval. That is the point we are trying to explain to you. All the duration of the Gentile, the reign of the Gentile, the reign of the church, they all took place between the interval before the end. Now we are living after the 69th week, before the 70th week. That is the time we are in God's calendar. And we don't know how long the interval lasts, just as it was never explained. In the book of Revelation. So also we cannot explain what intervals lasted on that year. Because we don't know the period. The time we don't know. If we can predict the time the interval starts and when it ends, we will be able to tell when Christ will return. But because we cannot predict how long God has chosen in his time to do his purpose, we can never predict the date of his return. So that's why no man knows the date, not even the angels. But the father will live. So that is exactly what happened in the interval. When the seventh seal was finally opened, after the interval between the sixth and the seventh, there was silence in heaven for about a space of half an hour. And I saw an angel which stood before God, and to them was given seven trumpets. That was the seventh seal kick in the seventh trumpets. The seventh seal, when you open it, God explains to you the next mystery of the seven trumpets. So, that is the end of our today's teaching. Now, brethren, having heard this, it is necessary for all to understand that God's will is not that any soul should perish. His will is that all men should come to repentance. This word was not written nor given to make anybody afraid. This word was given to save life right now. It was given to believers to make their way straight, to understand the event of the earth, of the end of the world, not to threaten your religions or belief, but to explain to you events that will surely come to pass on the earth, that you may prepare yourself and choose the path you wish to follow. God bless you as you listen. So, before we pray,
My name once again is Missionary Collins. I am from Christian Global Foundation. This is Open House Fellowship. We hold it every Sunday by 5 p.m. and on Tuesday by 7 p.m. Swedish time. God bless you as you partake in this teaching. And we hope to see you again next Sunday. If you miss any of our topic, you can go to our website to go through it. CGF NS login. CGF NS login dot app. CGF NS login dot app is the website. Or you can email us on info at CGF NS login. If you have any question or comment, we will be ready to respond to you. If you have anything like question, prayer request, send it to our email and we will reply you promptly. And God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for your testimony that was revealed tonight. We thank you for opening our eyes to the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. Holy Spirit, thank you for your insights and using this to set a standard for us to be able to explain the word of God. Father Lord, as we go in the coming week into the trumpet, the trumpet, your judgment, you will be able to show us more insight into your word and help us to understand your words so that we can use it to persuade men to repent and to change their way and return to you so that you might save them. Because it is not your will that any soul should perish. Your will is to bring all men to repentance. Father Lord, we pray for as many that are lost, that you through this word will draw them to your name, that all men might be saved, because that is your will. Father Lord, we pray for as many who are going through pain and torture, hoping within themselves we might see any good. Father Lord, let your hands of mercy be released upon them. Let the power of freedom take over them. Father, as many that are sick, I decree your healing. As many that are in bondage, I set them free. As many that are looking for opportunity in life, I send before them an open door which no man can shut. These days I decree it in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brethren, God bless you. We'll see you again on Tuesday by 7 p.m. Swedish time. And we hope every one of us understand. If you wish to watch this video again, you can still go to our website at cgfnslogin.com. God bless you as you participate. Amen.